Hi, this is Professor Raymond, and I'm using this video in order to make up for our missing snow day. Uh, one of our topics today is about body fluid compartments. Body fluid compartments are a way of describing where fluid is found in the body. They're generally divided into intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. Intracellular fluid is sometimes abbreviated ECF, and it's the fluid that's found inside of cells. Extracellular fluid is abbreviated ECF, and it's found outside of cells. If you look at this chart from the notes, it gives some general figures for how much body fluid there is in a body. 42 liters total. Of that, approximately two-thirds is intracellular fluid. Approximately one-third is extracellular fluid. So most of the fluid in the body is inside of cells. Only a little bit of it is outside of the cells. Of what's outside of the cells, there are two different compartments. There's plasma, and there's also interstitial fluid. Interstitial fluid is the smallest part of the extracellular fluid. It represents only about one-fifth of the total extracellular fluid. Now plasma is the extracellular fluid that is found in the circulatory system. Interstitial fluid is the extracellular fluid that's found anywhere else in the body. Now what's interesting about this is that the only part that we have direct access, that the kidneys have direct access to, is the plasma. We say that kidneys are cleaning toxins from the body, but it turns out the kidneys are really only filtering the plasma. That's the part they have access to. The interstitial fluid um, has to be done indirectly by a process called capillary exchange. And then the intracellular fluid has to be done even more indirectly, one step further removed, by processes that allow interstitial fluid to exchange with intracellular fluid. So here's how capillary exchange works. Suppose I've got a capillary bed here with blood entering in this direction and exiting in this direction. Um, inside this capillary bed, I'm going to have plasma. But that plasma can actually squeeze out through the pores and turn into interstitial fluid. Why isn't this working? Try again. There we go. It's big enough to see. Toward the end of a capillary bed, that process is reversed. At the end of the capillary bed, interstitial fluid actually squeezes back in to the capillary bed and turns back into plasma. So, the plasma is the only part that gets cleaned directly by the kidneys. But throughout the rest of the body, in the process called capillary exchange,
plasma becomes interstitial fluid, thereby renewing the interstitial fluid, old interstitial fluid that already has toxins in it actually becomes plasma. So the interstitial fluid is indirectly cleaned. Now you also have going on a process between the intracellular and extracellular fluid inside the cell is where you'd have your intracellular fluid. Outside your cell is where you'd have your extracellular fluid. Um, and so this because if this is throughout the rest of the body, this extracellular fluid would be interstitial. The fluid can exchange across the membrane in all of the ways we talked about in the first semester, having crossing of membranes. That is, through diffusion, osmosis, uh, vesicular transport like endocytosis and exocytosis, there would also be facilitated diffusion and active transport. So if you've got a toxin that starts out being produced inside of a cell, it can then move, so it starts out inside a cell, it can move to being outside of the cell by diffusion. This puts it into the interstitial fluid, which allows it to move into the plasma. The plasma then carries it to the kidneys, and the kidneys cleanse it. It returns to the capillaries, already cleaned by the kidneys, goes to the interstitial fluid, and from there, substances can move back into the intracellular fluid. So all of the body ends up being cleansed by the kidneys, but only the plasma is cleansed directly. Interstitial fluid is indirect. And only happens by capillary exchange. And then intracellular fluid happens by all the processes that allow things to cross membranes. So these numbers are showing you that only a very small part of the water is directly involved with the kidneys. And these other much larger volumes end up having to be cleaned indirectly. Now, when you look at these general numbers, it's important to keep in mind where these come from. These are not correct for every individual. These are based on what's called the medical standard. The medical standard is actually defined as a 150 pound male, early 20s, healthy. Might seem a little odd, perhaps sexist, that that would be the medical standard, but there are historical reasons why that was set up. And in particular, body fluid volumes, they are somewhat different by gender. One of the differences is that body fluid levels in women have a tendency to change during different times of the menstrual cycle. That can cause problems with medical research. If you're trying to achieve a particular concentration of a drug, then how much water is in a person, a participant's body, makes a difference in your dosing. If those things change from day to day throughout an experiment based on the menstrual cycle, that can be an extra complication that scientists might want to avoid. Uh, so the original justification for this medical standard was partly about simplifying things, because in science you're always trying to simplify things, and men are just simpler in many ways, hormonally. Um, one of the problems with that approach, though, is that the study population ends up not really matching the population of people that you're trying to treat with 
drugs that are used in medical research. The vast majority of people who take drugs are women, not men. Women are generally more compliant and take more drugs than men do. Also, older people, not people in their 20s, are the ones who take most of the drugs. People take most of the drugs in their life in the last few years of their life. Um, people who take drugs are likely to be sick. That's why they're taking them in the first place. But we do our medical research to show safety of a drug on healthy people. And we do it on people who aren't taking other drugs, at least not that they're admitting. Um, when the people who are taking drugs mostly are taking lots of different drugs that can interact with each other. So if what you're doing is studying a drug in young, male, healthy people who are not taking other drugs, and you're actually giving them to old, female, sick people who are taking lots of other drugs, that sets up a potential problem in whether or not your safety studies are really applicable. And so that has been a traditional problem. It's a problem that's being fixed. It's getting better because there's been an effort, especially at the NIH, to try to increase study populations to include older people, to include women, to include basically the people who are actually going to be taking a drug. There's a lot more progress to be made in that area, but the medical standard is something you should be aware of, because when you see numbers like the ones that I'm giving you here, those are based on that medical standard, and if you're not that medical standard, you shouldn't be surprised if your numbers vary from these. The fact that these might be different from person to person, though, is a reason not to take the absolute numbers very seriously. But it still means that the relationships are fairly consistent. About two-thirds of your total body water is intracellular, one-third extracellular. Of the extracellular fluid, about one-fifth is plasma, the other four-fifths is interstitial fluid. So plasma being one-fifth of extracellular, and extracellular being one-third of total, means that plasma is only about one-fifteenth of that total. 